method that I've chosen uh, a long time ago, and still of since a few days I already know what to talk about. Just first, a few words about me. Well, I grew up in the Alps, so I'm ready for the snow right now. The problem is that I'm no longer living in, in the Alps. I'm here in Nuremberg since 2010, and I did a lot of different things in the past, and that's a great base for that what I'm doing right now. I'm traveling around the whole year, doing mostly consulting, trainings, and so on. And, well, when I started to work at NetWays, this was also when I started to play around with Puppet, because initially Bernd asked me whether I'd like to write an article for the admin magazine, and I said, well, of course I do, I do everything. Uh, but I never used Puppet before, so I started to do a little bit of research, and, oh, yeah, um, as some, sorry, one slide back. Some South Tyrolean, that's that region in Italy where people are speaking something like German. Uh, I'm fluently speaking something like German and also Italian. And my, my English is not that best, but I'll, I try to be understandable. But yeah, so I researched. I did some research and find out what Puppet is and uh, how it works. and. Initially, I read some things like, if you have more than 20 nodes, better do not use the Puppet Master. So initially, I thought, oh my god, I will never use this tool. But <laughs> over time, I started liking it and discovered how it makes fun. And today, I'll try to show some parts of it. Um, some words on Puppet and Netways. We are proud to be official Puppet Labs partner. We're doing Puppet trainings in Germany. We've been the first ones doing so. Uh, the next days are in... Zurich in November, in the December, we have still one training in Nuremberg. We already fixed four days, no, five trainings for the next year already right now. And well, you find more things on our website. There is the, this one is the first puppet camp in Germany. And we'll have the second one after Open Source Data Center Conference in April. So please fix the date. We'll be reminded when you go out and see you there. Yeah, the call for paper is still running. And of course, we are hiring too. <laughs> 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 um, so a quick overview on what I'm talking about. I'll try to start with very simple things and show more interesting ones later. I'll talk about uh, famous YAML files, node classifiers. I'll just mention and touch custom functions, but not go much into detail there. I'll show you the REST API, as many people have for forgot that it still exists. Um, and then, by showing some best practices and issues, but most of them have already been shown by Ken before, uh, I'll go to the last example. Uh, I tried to wrote a simple data binding in director, doing that what Hira will be doing in Puppet 3. Yeah, YAML files. Yeah, YAML is, is a great language, market language, or it isn't. I hate it. it uh, <laughs> well, ha have a look at the specification, uh, and uh, have a look how long it is. You use some paper and print it out and compare it to the JSON specification, for example. It, and then, yeah. But it's using, well, the best things from C and Java and Perl and uh, Mail, and then mix in everything, and it's looking like that. <laughs> uh, a few very simple example. Yeah. You, can, you can write YAML. It's human readable, easy to understand and to write. The problem is with the version 1.2, even this thing here is valid YAML, so, and it's the same format. But, uh, maybe, uh, no. Before we're going there, just showing you a few files laying around, but I do not want to waste too much time with YAML. Um, Puppet is using YAML in different ways, and uh, in theory, you could use that files, play with them, provide YAML files. Um, this is one example of what it's looking like. Uh, and there are, no. well, for example, you have YAML files effects. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's what they look like. They are, in theory, easy to pass, but uh, not many people manage to write parsers uh, being able to do all of it. So for example, 
I had some luck with Perl. I had uh, PHP sec faulting on different files generat generated by Puppet. So they are there. You could use them, and people are doing so. But we don't have to. That's option one. External nodes. Well, I guess most many of you already did so, but just to explain what I'm talking about, no definitions usually start in the main manifest. Now we have a site PP or using other files and well, this is an example of what you could do. You can define node definition for a specific node, include classes there. You could um, use inheritance here, so you have base servers and use them as some kind of template. You can use pattern matching if you want. I like regular expressions, but I do not want usually to use them to decide which hosts to configure, but you can do so. And you have default nodes. I'm, for example, usually including a class like saying unconfigured and sending a note. Well, here's a note. I'm waiting for a config, so please do something with me or switch me off. And yeah, that's it. And using YAML and a thing called um, external node classifier, you can we can replace this thing here. So uh, plain text files are great. For even node classifiers are available, but many people still say, no, I want to have plain text files. Because so using them in my Git repository, I have a perfect history of which host had what config at what time. So they still make sense, but they're not so great if you want to have some kind of GUI integration to, uh, I do not want to have something like a Puppet dashboard to write plain text files and uh, mess with them and then care about multiple sessions handling with files and so on. And that's why we have the external node classifier. Well, it's, it's well documented. Mm, if I'm not wrong, it supports classes with parameters since 265. And the configuration is pretty easy. You're going to say, well, I have an external node classifier. As a so called node terminus, I'll come back to that word later. Um, have a specific script and you can, you can really use your preferred scripting languages language to do so to write such a node classifier. Uh, the output of that script, uh, uh, Puppet is calling the script just with script name, host name, and that's it. Uh, each time you trigger a Puppet run, it talks to the master, the master takes your host name, um, calls the external node classifier and says, well, I have server whatever, and please tell me what classes I'm going to assign to this node. And that's all. If you also want to use facts in there, you have to find something else or discover how to do so. It's just calling script name, host name, and that's it. Uh, your external node classifier can provide an output looking like, like this one here. You say, I have different classes, a base config class, a web server with parameters. That this, this, uh, this thing has not been possible before. Or you can provide global parameters, setting them, arrays, and so on. And set environment, and that's it. I use Perl for this example, but I'm going to use PHP and Ruby too in this presentation, so that's not my personal preference, just to, to show you how, how you're going to do something like that. I'm using Perl, using use the YAML library, get the host name as my first argument, and this is what you have to do by yourself. You have to write some lookup voodoo, use your, uh, your own CMDB, whatever, and get the host name and provide classes and parameters, config settings for exactly this host. Um, yeah, and do a YAML dump of the result and that's it. Mm. This is what what the dashboard is doing, what's what Foreman is doing, what many others are doing. Uh, it really makes sense. So you can have an, a nice GUI, say, well, I use this host or some group of hosts, assign classes, set parameters and you have no more passwords or something like that in your manifests. I could show up this in real life, but not so interesting. Whoop. Oh, sorry. Still being here. Uh, I call that in the script just to prove this. It's really the one we had before. So there's no voodoo right now in there. It's just the script from the slides. And, well, I, uh -huh. so 
Sorry. Yeah, I call it get an answer, and that's what Puppet is doing. Uh, you, you have still have to write them by yourself, so use something that already exists, but that's one interface Puppet provides to, to allow you to have such things externally. Mm. Then you have the possibility to use functions. Functions are yeah, parser functions, they're running on the master, so you can write in, in your manifest, look up something, and there is such function available since a while, it's called xlookup. Mm, this is a short example how to do, so you say, I will need a relay host, do an external lookup, want to have the setting called relay host and set a default parameter. So if it doesn't find anything, this is what it's going to use. The problem with xlookup is it's using comma separated value files as its data source. So that's not what everybody is very happy with. What is pretty cool is this it's allowing you to define some kind of fallback mechanism. So you can you can configure where these files are going to be find to found, sorry, and uh, you can set the precedence. So you can say, first look up my full qualified domain name, then maybe domain and just the domain part, and uh, then the file name common, that's, that's this one, and yeah, just, just do the look up and you know I have a fallback always in my, in my common file, so I do not have to specify it in the manifest. Yeah, this isn't perfect. Um, we have Hira, uh, n also no example here, just showing how it works. Um, right now you're writing using param classes with parameters as Ken has shown before. Uh, version is, and the default value is the Hira function. So I'm looking for Apache version, setting a default value also here, and that's it. But it's, it doesn't look so good. Uh, it's ugly. And with oh yeah, with Puppet 3, they, they added one, one small thing that's very important, the namespace. So you no longer have to write Apache here. I just write version and that's it, and can do so in every class. Or even better, Puppet 3 has a thing that's called data binding indirector. We'll see this one also later on. It's a great word. Um, so this means that you no longer have to write higher here. You write version is default value, and if this parameter is, is missing, it's using higher to look it up. And well, it code looks much cleaner doing it like this. So, but we'll, we'll see this later. Um, I'm not showing functions and facts right now, because otherwise I would run out of time, and this is something we are always doing in, uh, in the Puppet training, so probably many of you already have seen it, or you fin find many, many docs showing you how to write these functions. It's pretty easy. Don't be scared, just use something that exists, copy it, and even if you don't like Ruby, it's, it's easy to do so. Um, you have functions that can be used on the master. Uh, if you need something from, from the agents, of course, th that's not possible, you have to use facts store them in your modules and use plugin sync. So it's really great because you just have a module with some custom function and you can use it everywhere it works. But well, that's not covered right now. And use plugin sync. Uh, before going to the redirector, I will show you the, the REST API. So I'm switching from one topic to the other one. Um, but this thing is easier. Uh, the REST API, well, first, do you know what REST is? It's, it's uh, just um, it's some kind of web service. It's HTTP, stupid, simple, and they thought we, if you have HTTP and we have different methods there, it doesn't make sense to just use uh, get and post and that's it. And they're using a different set of, of operations. So you can do more with HTTP than a browser is usually doing. That's the idea behind REST. And well, just a web, web service offers a different collec collection of resources. You identify them by the URL they have, and you are also using different media types. So you can also use it to, to push binary data, delete it, or whatever. And but this is what your URLs look like, more or less. They are available on the master and the agent. 
uh, even there. But on the agent only, if you're doing listen through, so you have to, to have the agent listen running. This is what you also need if you're doing a puppet kick, for example. Puppet kick is just doing a restful request. Um, you have different ports on master and agent, but for the rest, they're the same. They're offering, of course, um, different content you can access, but they're working the same, same way. Um, just some examples. You can you can retrieve uh, files from the file bucket. It's a great thing you can sometimes use. You have somewhere uh, some tool passing your log files, and you decide that uh, you do not want to leave your files only there and take the log file output and uh, retrieve the file with that MD5 some store it somewhere else. That's this could be tasks you could use this for. You can get the facts, the facts from a specific host. This is, for example, something you can also do on the agent. And you can also get the catalog. Um, yeah, for some parts, if you want to use the REST API to access them, you, uh, you have to allow access to them. For example, the facts are usually not accessible. You have to change your out conf and, and allow it. And still related to security, you have to use certificates. So this is how you're going to do it with curl. It's uh, it looks a little bit scary, but you can set the variable and and, and put all this in there. And mm, well, you are just doing a request. Important is this thing here. I'm accepting yeah YAML, but you can use JSON too. And yeah, let's try it out just to prove that it works. That's a curl request. Uh, no, that's not enough. Okay, well let's. It works. I'm just using curl. Uh, getting getting the data there is great. We we have all the facts and. Yeah, I'm still not very exciting, but I can use this API. But then, um, please do. Oh, this later. Uh, let's switch to the next one, please. Um, this one first, sorry. Uh, please don't do something like that. And don't use an output we have here and do curl, pipe, grab, pipe, uh, whatever. Uh, there are other languages. Here, once again, this is PHP. There's also Perth that you can use Python, Ruby, whatever. I made a little, a small example just showing you that if you put in a little bit of effort to write some, some nice class doing this doing an abstraction to the service, you can do very nice things. So I'm, I'm right now just doing, uh, connecting to the Puppet API, getting the fact from a specific host, adding the host name, and yeah. Here I'm just creating some output. Uh, uh, once again, that's, that's the script. Nothing else in here. I'm using the, the library and then running this thing. And if you're running, it's saying, well, that the host is running Debian. Not so exciting, but you can do lo a, a lot of things. You have, you have different uh, other open source software systems. You have a CMDB. You can do some integration with whatever you need. Uh, the data is there. You can talk directly to, pup to, to, to Puppet. So, yeah. And to show you how this this looks like so it's, it's nothing special in there it's just a it's a php class what i'm doing well most important i say i do not want to have yaml but you can use it too and set the path to the certificates and so on and uh, i created a few functions just calling my own fetch url function uh, setting the url i'm interested in having a look if uh, the data i'm i want to have is there and and return it that's it I skipped one slide. That's what I wanted to say. Um, the advantage of using REST is, you, for example, you could also use the data in your in your store config backend in your Puppet DB. But if you're using the REST API, you can be pretty sure that it doesn't change so fast. You don't have to worry about schema changes or uh, switching from active rep record data voodoo to Puppet DB. So that's not, your, not your problem. You are just getting a host from the master, getting facts, and, and that's it. Yeah. 
Mm. The next part is just here to, um, to show you why I did the last example. Ken showed you more or less the same, so I'll do it. I, I have prepared it differently, but let's have a look at it quickly. Um, first, we had global variables. This has been a long time ago. No one is still doing so, so this is how it works first. Uh, right now, we have class parameters. That's great. That's how classes should look like, and of course, they have to be in your modules. Um, the problem with that's the reason why Ken showed us the button before is if you are doing some, well, you want to have default values and some more complex checking or default setting if it isn't provided, uh, it's going A, to be ugly, and B, you cannot reassign a variable. Uh, and that means this example, even if it's not package is not defined, will fail. You cannot reassign the, the variable here. And that's why many of us has done something like this. I have a package parameter and using a real package variable here and going to use this one. So I have no collision, but it's, it's even more ugly than the ex example before. And that's the pattern we've seen um, in Ken's presentation. We have class parameter, uh, parameter classes. We are doing this uh, default parameter value voodoo in this class, but we still have the same parameter in the class we're going to use and and set the, oops, now yeah, we are inheriting the, is it correct? Yeah, the, the, other, the other class and setting the default value to the parameter we have set there. So it's, that's the reason for doing so. It, it's great, it makes everything more readable and if you have all your modules done like this, um, you immediately know where to look for this and, well, it works, but it's, it's, it's still a little bit ugly. And another problem I want to show you first is, well, if I have class dependencies. Huh? Include is great. If I say include somewhere, I can, I, include I can include the same class multiple times, nothing bad happens. Uh, I have two web applications, both of them need Apache, and it works. Uh, I cannot do so if I'm using uh, classes this way with or without parameters because that way I have a collision, it doesn't work, I cannot compile the catalog. So that's, well, that's one example, I can, I can write require two, but that's how we, we have been taught to, to do so. If we have dependencies, you can write, well, my class here is going to be run after the Apache class, the same thing here, and on the node definition I say, well, first I need Apache with some parameters, whatever, and then I need, or well then before, I need the other two um, classes, the web applications here, and the dependencies to make sure that, that the Apache will run first. Uh, but just uh, using the class web application doesn't define the Apache, so I always have to, have to take care to to load the classes I need in the nodes, or to put this logic in my node classifier I have written with my own Voodoo, and that one knows if I assign that node a uh, web application, I also have to assign them the Apache. Uh, it works, but I don't really like it. But uh, it helps if, you, if I do not assign the class, the compilation fails. So I still have the dependency checking there, just I have to do the job on the node. And well, all these are such called best practices. You find many of them, you find many blog posts, you find them on the Puppet Wiki and documentation and so on. Um, and all of them fix specific problems. Uh, there's another one left as a homework for you, so if you want to solve this, have fun. It's just, I have a define, I just want to use the define, but I do not want to care about the, the fact that the define is the Apache, so it should, yeah. Um, well, and all this leads me to my last example I have, and that's, that's the largest one. Um, in Puppet, we have so-called um, yeah, termini or a terminus. Terminus is just the, the, the name Puppet is using for, for different implementations of a Puppet internal model. So there, in the Puppet code, there exists uh, 
Termini, that's the plural in Latin, uh, for nodes, for facts, for catalogs. And in Puppet Free, we have such thing also for data bindings. And data bindings is the name for this, what we have seen before. Um, I, I'm using Hira and uh, I do not have to write the Hira function in the, in the definition of the class, in the default value of the, of the class parameter. It, it happens automatically. So um, this is great. And by default, it is using Hira. You can switch it off. And I like this. But then, uh, honestly, I, I didn't use Hira for a long time. Initially, I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's great. But yeah, you could also use it with MySQL, but that's not already there. Someone made something on GitHub, but I didn't have time to, to try it out. And my impression was, yeah, that's a good idea, but uh, well. Mm, and that's why I, my first idea was, oh, wow, that that place where Hire is sitting in, in Puppet 3, I want to be there. I want to have my script, my logic, uh, sitting there where I'm assigning default values to, to missing parameters. And I'm, I'm not a Ruby guy, so I'm, I'm scripting and coding a lot, but I never did, did something interesting with Ruby. So I grabbed around, found where they're doing this, and that's a piece of code from, from, Ruby uh, from Puppet. They're just, uh, well, first composing the namespace param, yeah, that's new. So they are always setting the, the namespace in front of the parameter name, and they are using this variable, and they're calling puppet data binding in direction, and looking there for this parameter and passing, well, the host. So, well, it looks good. Then, mm, yeah, and this is my last example. So we'll be back in time. Mm. In Puppet 3, we have the possibility to say, well, my, my data binding terminus is um, default is higher. Uh, you can set none to switch it off. And I, I wrote IDO. Uh, IDO is the single database backend. That's, that's the first uh, database that came to my mind that I, that I always have on my laptop. So I've been using this. But uh, use your, your own CMDB. Use whatever database you want. I just wanted to have a lookup in, in some database. and the first step. Then what I had to write is there is in the uh, in puppet in the Ruby directory there is uh, an indir indirector directory with the data binding directory in there and that's why I just used there was is a non uh, indirector there and I copied it and I made my own one. Um, nothing special here is the they moved the class to the um, one directory up to the in the in indirector directory. So here I'm just inheriting the class I've written there. So this is just copy and paste work, nothing special. And the indirector itself. Oops. Isn't here. Well, that, that's more or less all of it. I'm inheriting from, from the indirect terminus. I define a function. I just define the defined function and nothing else. And uh, this function will get the, a request as a parameter. And there are two things in there. The, it has the key you're looking for and an options hash. And you have the host name in there. So that's all you need. What you could do, what, for example, Hire is doing, um, you can do call the indirector for factor. So you in theory, you could also replace that part of Puppet and looking for the host name. Yeah, then you, you get a, a hash full of your facts. Um, but I, I didn't need this what for my ex example, so I skipped this. Mm, I'm replacing the double column with an underscore because I'm, I'm going to look for, for those who use Nagios, there are those custom bars, something underscore, something else. And I decided, well, Right now, for example, I'm just not interested in the namespace and looking up the name itself. So putting out a notice, hey, I'm looking for some key for a specific host. And that's a fix just for the demo. Uh, I don't have the host I'm running this on in my, in my single database. So that's, that's, that's why I'm 
doing some hard coded thing and overwriting the host name, of course, this doesn't, doesn't make sense. And then, IDO host is the first Ruby class I've ever written. I'm returning, an in, uh, I've worded as, as a singleton to not have a database connection every time. Uh, I'm passing the host name and get, getting a specific custom bar with a key. Yeah? So the class here is something I've written for this backend. I'm going to show it to you, but uh, that's something, uh, that, that's where your logic goes, where you are looking up every parameter. So if a, a class, um, this right now you're doing this in DNC. But you could, uh, it's an idea, I, I, I'm not yet sure if I want to do this, but it's, it's, it's cool. And so, well, just a, sh a short look at the, the class itself. This is, well, I told before, I'm not a Ruby expert, so I added a class requiring the DBI. Um, made the new function private as I wanted to have a singleton and just plain SQL. And then I'm connecting to the database, preparing the statement, but I do not execute anything. And here is the get custom bar function. And this is where I'm executing the query, passing the key and the host name and, well, fetching the first row. It's I guess it could be done better and returning it and that's it. If it doesn't work, um, right now I'm just outputting a notice, but this is where, where you should ma make the, the puppet run, uh, the, the catalog compilation fail. So put a fail in there, because I if data lookup doesn't work, you want puppet to stop. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I wrote a stupid simple manifest. I have... Uh, a test class and looking the, up the data center and the, and the rec number. RZ is for Reching Zentrum, that's, that's the German name for data center. And, and including the class right here. So don't do it like this. It's, it's, it's just a stupid example. And my host has two custom bars, underscore RZ and underscore rec. And well, it's, it's fast and it works. And this. Uh, this is my last example, and I'm very interested in feedback, but I, st I still do not know if I want to do it like this, but it's, it's pretty, pretty cool, I think. And yeah, well, that's all for now. Thank you. Uh, we still have time for questions, but before you're leaving, uh, thank you for haven't been here. We, uh, we didn't expect so many people. It was a great conference. Um, we're doing, we fixed the date. We're doing the next uh, Puppet Camp after our OSDC, the Open Source Data Center confer Conference in April. So see you guys back there. And n right now, questions, please. Oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, the just to remind you, the feedback sheet in in your yellow blue thing you got there. How do you say it in English? I don't know. Uh, we really want to have your feedback, even if you think you didn't, didn't like everything. So write it down. We want to hear it. And questions? OK. Uh, one short question. Uh, the last example you did with the Temini, mm -hmm. can you attach more than one so you can ask your iSync card DB, you can ask another CMDB, is it possible to, to add more DBs in that? You can, but you, you have to do this logic in your own Ruby script there. So, so you have only one data binding terminus, just one? One only and yeah. I have to, to select it in my Ruby code for Exactly, example. yeah. Okay. Uh, There's one over here. Could you go four slides back? Sure. This? No, yeah. huh? um, is it possible to simulate this uh, environment with an ENC? So, where sure. we sure uh, uh, you're just defining the, the web app and the both those classes, and on the the ENC is passing both classes, and of, of course the the patch and the version that that works, and you have to have the logic that you have to add the Apache class in your ENC. Okay, because currently I have set up a sort of wrapper class, which is 
doing the require logic and so on. Yeah, uh, also, m but too it's great. Yeah. It's ugly, it's, it's really ugly, so, yeah. Uh, the advantage of, of uh, using the place where Hira is sitting in Puppet 3 is that you, you can use include once again. And yeah, of course, you have the logic you have in your class than somewhere else, but you can, you can use more includes. You can use includes in, in your defines. Are bad, yeah? Yeah? Includes are bad. They are, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Show me something better. <laughs> Thank you. As you said earlier, um, you didn't know if you want to uh, uh, use Haya instead of an uh, external node classifier. We've got a few Puppet Labs guys here. Maybe they want to ask, answer this question. Anyone? Oh, yeah. I've been looking for you. <laughs> Um, I think they do two different things. So I, I look at a, I look at an, um, and from my perspective, uh, not all of your data is going to live in 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 a, an ENC. So I, I look at the ENC as more a node classification tool, maybe more a role-based concept. Um, whereas I look at um, uh, here and things like that as being something. Um, maybe it looks up a CMDB. Maybe it looks up uh, you know an LDAP server or something. Whatever that happens to be, that tends to be. Um, I guess more transient sort of data, variable-like things. Um, I think you could probably do that. Um, I, I guess that, that they could have the same data source, um, but from the perspective of, of um, structuring your manifests, yeah, I, I would probably leave them separate. Um, other people might give you a different, slightly different answer. So Luke, for example, would say that, that the node object should ultimately go away, and we shouldn't have nodes as a concept anymore. We should just have, you know, um, boxes that connect and the, you know, the, the, the the data lookup knows it's this role and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure I agree with him, but I, you know, I think I would keep them separate for the moment because it, it's in terms of the simple implementation, you can explain to people how it works. You know, in, in data for nodes comes in this end, variables come in that end. You know, it's a, there's a clear separation there. Um, yeah, your mileage may vary. Anyone else? Well, so, yeah. For <laughs> <laughs> uh, your challenge and the uh, things, the include patterns you presented, yeah. how to define inter-class inter dependencies, uh, there's, in my experience, one quick solution when you have this kind of situation where you have two applications requiring a common base class mm. that needs to be parameterized somehow, uh, usually what you want to have there is uh, a third, a new class which parameterizes this class and uh, the other two just can just include again. And uh, one other thing, uh, I've used require for a while, but uh, I don't know if that's been deprecated maybe ma by now and stuff, because that creates links between classes, like in the dependency graph, as far as I uh, recollect. Yes, that well, uh, this is the same as doing require. Yeah, yeah, right. But require also had some nasty side e uh, side effects, so that's why I'm kind of careful now using it nowadays. But that was my initial uh, way of um, modeling these uh, dependencies yeah. instead of with uh, with includes. So I've been yeah, because I I never cared about this problem. I think that this this has to be solved in Puppet itself and. Uh Right, but but the abstraction, uh, abstracting the common base class, which needs to be parameterized somehow, I find more useful uh, because. Uh, when I install, uh, as an example from operating system package management, when I install something like Redmine, uh, it'll do the some crazy things, install a MySQL server or whatever else, whatever the default uh, package maintainer thought should be the default configuration. So I think in a way, um, Puppet, uh, when I include something like, uh, like, like um, Redmine, uh, the Redmine Puppet class, I expect the same magic to happen somehow without having to include and parameterize every single class uh, on my own. On That's my right. Own if you have, over the time, then more of those common aggregation classes, and then something needs uh, different ones of them, 
I just want to have, con I, I don't know, I'm installing a, an application that uh, does a lot of things and needs Redmine and uh, three other applications. We have the same problem again and are creating such common classes again and again. But they, th that's how I'm doing it too, it works. It's Yeah, so great. Thank you again. Yeah. Oh, there's one more question. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I got this from some. I don't know if it's written on some Puppet Labs wiki site or something. Because I, I, I didn't write this myself because I, I'm speaking fluently Italian, but no, no Latin, so. Uh, I disco discovered this somewhere else, so excuse me. <laughs> and well, on the program we we have right now, well, space for open discussion. If you want to, we can do it here or outside with some coffee. Or I guess many of you are leaving because it's Friday evening. So have a good evening, have a good weekend. Sorry, and see you again.